Okay, uh, we're going to get started. And today, Dr. Nichols couldn't uh, come and lecture on radiation oncology, so I'll be giving the second lecture on small cell lung cancer. And our first speaker today is Ravi Madan. He's going to be talking about prostate cancer. He got his MD from the New Jersey Medical School, subsequently did a residency uh, in internal medicine. He joined the NCI Medical Oncology Branch in 2005 and holds a joint appointment in the Medical Oncology Branch in the Laboratory of Tumor Immunology and Biology. He's a staff clinician in the Genitourinary Malignancies Branch. Ravi. Thank you. I got a little nervous there. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for being a couple minutes late. I was in clinic, but I got a little nervous that the radiation guy wasn't going to be here. I know nothing about that, although I have about three or four slides on it, but you'll pretty much be able to tell how little I know about that from that part of the equation. So today we're talking about prostate cancer, which doesn't immediately come across as perhaps the most interesting disease to some of you. Uh, it's not always thought of as perhaps one of the more uh, innovative fields, but what you'll see is there's been a lot of innovation and a lot has uh, been achieved in just a very short period of time, and now we have to figure out what to do with all that data. What I'll try to go over today really is, is how we manage these patients. The first half of the talk really talks about the disease and uh, tr curative therapies, and the second half tries to talk about uh, metastatic uh, treatments uh, for um, try to delay progression and palliation. So I work here, so I have really no disclosures. Um, you know, I think I kind of went over the ob educational objectives. The outline, again, is, is as I've alluded to, so um, we'll go from there. Also. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me, make sure I'm not misleading the crew, and uh, I'll try to remember to repeat them because I think this is being webcast or recorded or something. So this is perhaps one of the more important slides I'll show. It highlights the kind of treatment landscape for prostate cancer as it changes. The way the, uh, the, the graph works is you start off with newly diagnosed disease, local therapies are potentially curative. As the disease recurs, um, castration or lowering of testosterone is the primary way to control this disease once it's no longer curative. That's because testosterone or androgens bind to an androgen receptor, and that's what fuels the growth of prostate cancer. And you'll see that from the therapies that I'll be talking about later. That that's a major focus of therapy. Uh, that can bring about short-term control over the long term, however, the disease progresses and then death occurs at this point here. You see below are some classifications of symptoms, so it often takes a long time in the disease course to develop symptoms and then they gradually escalate. Obviously, it also takes a long time for the disease to become metastatic. The term castration sensitive and castration resistant, I'll introduce them now. Castration sensitive basically just means if you lower the hormones, if you lower the testosterone, you control the disease. The PSA goes down, which is a, tum a tumor marker in prostate cancer, and then the disease can stay contained. When the disease grows, either by PSA or radiographically, despite castration levels of testosterone, that's considered castration resistant. So it kind of makes sense after you've heard it. So you see that as of 2005, this is kind of where we were. Docetaxel was a chemotherapy um, that was only approved in 2004, and really until then we just had some hormonal manipulations and local therapies, and that was it. Then there was about a decade where everybody combined their favorite drug with docetaxel, and this did not lead to any new positive uh, improvements in survival. But then some new things started coming about. In 2010, a therapeutic cancer vaccine came along. And then a couple years later, radium-223, a, a pharmaceutical agent. Uh, you see kind of the time frame where these tr treatments can be implemented. A second line chemotherapy, interestingly, also a taxane like docetaxel, showed uh, an improvement in survival in 2010. Two, Hormonal therapies, abiraterone and enzalutamide, were approved in 2011 and 2012 for patients who had already had chemotherapy. And then later studies proved that it was beneficial uh, for patients who had not received chemotherapy with metastatic disease. So all these therapies, again, some are duplicated because of pre and post chemotherapy trials, but all these therapies improved survival in metastatic castration resistant uh, prostate cancer over a very short period of time. And again, the most remarkable part, beyond the fact that you've got five new therapies for a cancer in a short time period, is they're essentially from, I'm sorry, it's more than, it's six new therapies, but it's from five different modalities. You have a, a, a vaccine, a chemotherapy, 
uh, hormonal therapies and um, radiopharmaceutical. So very uh, dynamic time still for prostate cancer. Let's, but let's get to the basics and then we'll come back to some of these therapies and talk about them again at the end. Prostate cancer affects a lot of people. Nearly 220,000 men are diagnosed each year. Um, and then unfortunately 27,000 or so men will die in 2015 from prostate cancer. Lifetime risk of having the disease is one in six to one in eight men, depending on, on the surveys. So greatest in incidence, second most lethal cancer. Risk factors aren't immediately clear to us. There are some you know, indirect evidence that maybe racially uh, African-Americans have more lethal disease than, than Caucasians, and Asians actually have less lethal disease than in, when it comes to prostate cancer. It's highlighted by some of this. There's not really clear genetic predispositions. Again, there's so many men afflicted with this, it becomes difficult. There is some data that environmental uh, impact uh, is, is possible. Maybe that's why you see differences between Caucasians and African-Americans and Asians. Uh, obesity is implicated in many cancers and prostate cancer is one of them. What about preventing prostate cancer? So this is, seems like always a big deal. And there's actually been some studies that, show, that were done to see if we could prevent prostate cancer. I think as you guys go through your courses, it's good to hear a cautionary tale about uh, preventative measures. So two drugs that are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, they basically block testosterone production within the prostate tissue. They, uh, they had studies that demonstrated a reduction in the incidence of prostate cancer in men who were treated with these uh, uh, therapies. Um, in, in two same class medications from two separate trials. Interestingly, there was some suggestion that these Preventative measures increase the grading of the disease, and I'll come back to what grading is in a second, but that was that could be explained away. But the fundamental issue here is that these treatments came with side effects. There were some side effects of altering the testosterone in men, and largely patients would go on it, but wouldn't stay on it for a long period of time. So we always talk about preventing cancer, but when it comes to treatments that prevent cancer, you have to be realistic in terms of the side effects you think your patients are going to be willing to take on. There's a similar story in tamoxifen in breast cancer where it's a, not also a commonly used but effective measure. Also of note, there's, been a, there's always interest in terms of minerals and vitamins that prevent tri, uh, for, um, uh, cancer. And there was actually a very large trial done called the SELECT trial, which looked at vitamin E and selenium. And unfortunately, despite all the preclinical data about free radicals and various other perspectives, there was no protective benefit, but it was a large a large effort was done uh, in this. So mixed signals really with prevention. I mentioned grading. So this is what the tumor looks like on the mic under the microscope and how we try to describe it, understand how aggressive the disease can be or will become. So it's basically a, a score is given to the tumor when we look at it under the microscope from one to five. One is, is almost never, see never reported. Um, five is extremely disorganized, so it's basically a, uh, a scale of anarchy or diff poorly differentiated uh, cells are with higher numbers. And um, so when you see a prostate cancer, it usually is followed by what's called a Gleason score. So, and there's usually two of them. There's always two of them. Uh, one is the one that's in the most dominant part of the pathological field, and the other is in the secondary uh, or second most predominant. So patients will often have Gleason eight prostate cancer, but the scale only goes up to five. So that usually means they have Gleason 4 plus 4, and often you'll see that in parentheses. So just um, something to understand. Intermediate risk is anything that's Gleason 6 or less. Gleason 7 is, I'm sorry, Gleason 6 or less is low risk. Gleason 7 is intermediate risk. Gleason 8, 9, or 10 are high risk. And that comes into um, play a little bit when we decide how to treat these diseases. Staging, another obligatory slide. It's a little bit easy with prostate cancer if you simplify it to stage one, two, three, and four. Stage one means one lobe is impacted with the disease. Stage two means two lobes. Stage three means it's broken out uh, of, one of, uh, of one of the two lobes. And stage four means it's metastatic. So I think if you think of it that way, you can think of it as localized disease stage one and two, locally advanced is stage three, and metastatic disease is stage four. What about I mentioned all these great therapies. How do we decide if everybody needs to be treated? Now, this sounds strange because cancer always sounds like it should be treated. But the timeline of the disease, as you'll see in some later slides, 
allows for more discussion about whether patients need to be treated. Also, these are often older men. So we're not practicing ageism or saying that old people don't deserve therapy. But if you're 78 years old and you're diagnosed with low-grade prostate cancer and you have heart disease, diabetes, and a history of a stroke, you may not live long enough from your other, what we call competing morbidities, to die from your prostate cancer. So the reality is, if you have a patient who's maybe 75 years old and has all these other, what we call competing mor mor morbidities, maybe you shouldn't even be checking PSA anymore or looking for the cancer if they have other things. By the same token, if you have an 85-year-old who is healthy as can be and is diagnosed with intermediate prostate cancer, you might want to cure that patient because he might have another decade to live. So it's kind of a give and take, and there's no hard and fast rules, but this is kind of a general outline. To just define a couple terms that get thrown around a lot in prostate cancer, there's watchful waiting and active surveillance if you're not doing therapy. Watchful waiting, they both sound like the same thing. One sounds a little more politically correct. But watchful waiting basically says, like I said, you got a patient who you don't think you need to treat. You're not going to check PSA. You're not going to monitor for the disease. If they develop symptoms, you'll, you'll take care of it. Active surveillance is different, however. This is, OK, they, they're kind of, I may or may not treat this patient, but I'm going to follow their PSA. And if there's big changes in their disease burden on scans, maybe I'm more inclined to treat them. So just to define some terms that get used in prostate cancer um, a lot. So. Active surveillance kind of hints at the intent to treat at some point. OK. This, you're either going to love this slide or hate this slide. I think it's helpful in defining what I was talking about earlier. It's from older data, but it still applies, except for the fact that you almost never see anyone diagnosed with Gleason 5 or less prostate cancer. But what it's showing is basically broken up by year. So you see age 50 to 59, and then age 70 to 74 with these intervening boxes. And then it shows Gleason 6, 7, so low risk, intermediate risk, and then high risk. And then it shows death from disease within 20 years, OK? So what you see in the dark gray color is people dying of their prostate cancer. Light gray is dying of everything else. So this goes again to what I said. If you have a patient who's in their 70s with you know, other comorbidities, they're more likely to die from other things in the light gray than the dark gray of prostate cancer. So maybe you don't need to treat them and give them the side effects of therapy um, with surgery or radiation in an attempt to cure them if they're more than likely to die from something else. The flip side is you have a very aggressive disease in a young patient, and you see their mortality risk from prostate cancer, as you would expect, is extremely high. So this just kind of il illustrates what I've kind of outlined. You kind of take into a lot of account uh, where they are on this Gleason score, so how aggressive the underlying disease is and how healthy the patient is in terms of competing morbidity. So I'm going to show you today that it basically that gives proof for what you probably already would believe if I didn't show you data. But not surprisingly, if you do surgery on patients, you have a higher risk of curing them than you know, if you do nothing and it proves survival. That's really what we're trying to say here. And so surgery is one of the interventions in men with prostate cancer. And this was a study done a long time ago that showed that surgery did improve survival compared to uh, uh, watchful waiting. Radiation therapy is another curative uh, treatment. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, I already gave the disclaimer, I'm not a radiation oncologist, but you can basically shoot different electrons and protons and photons at the tumor in a very targeted manner with the goal of destroying cancer cells, damaging DNA, et cetera, and, um, and curing patients of their prostate cancer. So for a subset of patients, Radiation is a curative therapy when it's localized. So surgery and radiation are only effective at curing the disease, really when it's contained in the prostate. Radiation may be effective if there's a couple lymph nodes around the prostate that can be radiated. Brachytherapy is another form of radiation. Lots of men prefer brachytherapy just from a time standpoint. It, the standard radiation therapy occurs on daily doses every six weeks. Brachytherapy, you go to the doctor once, they implant these radioactive seeds in the prostate, and then it slowly emits radiation over a period of time and kills the prostate cancer. Again, a curative measure, but generally only beneficial to patients with two types of, well, one type of prostate cancer, and that's low risk disease. Aggressive cancer has generally not been shown to be that responsive to this therapy. Also, if you have a large prostate, so prostate size varies. Um, 
and there's different ways that it can be measured, but patients who have a very large prostate, the brachytherapy doesn't deliver the radiation appropriately, and therefore, unfortunately, this therapy is not a good option. So aggressive disease and large prostates, brachytherapy isn't an option, but you'll see a lot of men like this because it's really a one treatment with potential cure. What are some of the complications from radiation? Uh, you can get colitis or irritation of the bowels leading to diarrhea or proctitis, which is inflammation of the rectum um, from the radiation. There can be erectile dysfunction with both surgery and radiation. And there is a risk of secondary malignancy, sometimes even 15 or 20 years later. It's not uncommon to see patients come back with, with bladder cancer maybe 10 or 15 years after their radiation from their, of their prostate for curative prostate therapy. Um, I think I took my slide out for uh, surgery complications, sorry, but when you're looking at surgery and radiation and you're trying to compare which a, a patient should do, generally surgery has more incontinence, radiation has more urinary retention, and I would just think of it that way. There have been no studies that definitively show which of these therapies are better, mainly because men are not willing to be randomized to surgery or radiation. Generally, they come in with a very fixed opinion of whether they want surgery or they don't, and so those trials have largely gone um, un, been unsuccessful because we can't accrue to those studies. I mentioned this earlier, and one of the, uh, you know, there is rationale to deprive the test testosterone or androgens to the tumor with either pharmacologic therapy or orchiectomy, which is removal of the testicles. That can improve survival over um, no treatment alone. And in some patients who may not be healthy enough for surgery, may not be candidates for radiation, primary androgen deprivation therapy is one possibility of delaying kind of the ultimate onset of, of metastatic disease and symptoms, but it is not a curative therapy. So even though the cancer needs androgens to survive, uh, depriving it of, of androgens is not a way to cure it of the disease. So I'm going to go over this quickly just because I think that it's not as probably valuable in the context of this course, but what about combining some of, some of these two things? So there is data that says that surgery combined with, radi um, surgery combined with hormones, uh, surgery combined with radiation, and radiation combined with hormones increase cure rates over surgery alone in these two cases or radiation alone in this case, but it's in a subset of patients. So just so you know that this has been looked at. Um, I, if you look at, in some cancers, however, like breast cancer, they give neoadjuvant chemotherapy or hormone therapy to shrink the tumor down. In prostate cancer, that has not been shown to be a, uh, an effective uh, technique. What has been shown is that if patients have surgery and then they have a lymph node that's positive, if you give those patients hormone therapy immediately, they live longer than if you don't give them hormone therapy until they have metastatic disease. This data needs to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt because it doesn't allow for you to start treatment if they're node positive at surgery, like before they get metastatic disease. So in an extreme setting, hormones in this situation is beneficial in the adjuvant setting and for at least uh, for uh, oncologists, it's kind of a good board question that they ask a lot, but it's one of the indications of adjuvant therapy in prostate cancer. This is kind of makes sense, this study here, which showed improvement in overall survival and metastasis-free survival if you had T3 disease. So think about it. If you have cancer that's broken out of the prostate when you do surgery, or if you have a positive margin, there's something left behind to radiate, and so those patients do better. So this makes intuitive sense. This doesn't always happen in, in oncology where the study that you do that makes sense actually plays out like you think it should, but in this case, it does. So it makes sense if you have local disease left after surgery that radiation can be curative. And studies have shown that hormone therapy when combined with radiation can also delay recurrence of disease and improve survival. So um, there's different time frames. Intermediate risk, generally it's about six months of therapy. Uh, high risk patients, again, that's Gleason 7, 8, 9, and PSA maybe greater than 20 and some other characteristics. They give the hormone therapy for two to three years. So global big picture overview of kind of uh, curative attempts to cure the disease in prostate cancer. Uh, unfortunately, not in everybody is that possible. Um, and they about 20 to 40% of patients who have curative surgery or radiation will ultimately develop recurrent disease. 
So I'm going to just stop there and make sure there's any, are there any questions? I know it can get a little confusing with all this data about curative attempts at prostate cancer, but any questions about surgery or radiation? Or if you have questions about how you, we choose or how patients choose, that's a good question because there's not a real, you, you kind of just sit down with a patient and say, these are your options and these are your side effects. What are you most comfortable with? And well, obviously it's easy if patients have heart disease and they're not a candidate for surgery, but but that's kind of a big elephant gun shot of uh, curative th therapy. So any, any questions about that? Yes. So that's a good question. Are, are, are things changing, I think, is the fundamental question. And I think the answer is yes. The reason that I, I didn't show just because of time, I'll just tell you real quick how we diagnose pri prostate cancer. We basically take a guy with a high PSA. This is until about two years ago, a year ago. So things are really just changing. But we take patients who had a high PSA and get them to the operating room. And then urologists, not me, but urologists, basically stick needles anywhere in the prostate, 12 random spots and hope that you hit the tumor. So just think about that with colon cancer or breast cancer. You think a patient has cancer, let's just stick a needle randomly in that organ and hope we get a diagnosis. Well, that's changed now. And what's changed is that in, in technology that was largely developed here by Pete Choiki, Barris Turk Bay in molecular imaging, and P, uh, Peter Pinto in urology, they've developed the ability now uh, for the first time to actually see the tumors within the prostate. And so now what actually we can do is say, all right, your PSA is high, let's get an MRI, there's the tumor, let's stick a needle in that tumor. That's changing things radically. So what sometimes can now happen is we can take a patient who has Gleason 7 disease, biopsy the tumor, which we can now discreetly see within the MRI, uh, images of the prostate, and then basically say, all right, your tumor is pretty small, it's very discreet, we can follow it. We've done a lot of biopsies. There is some four in there, which makes it a seven, but it's not the dominant one. So maybe you're a candidate for surveillance. What we need to investigate moving forward is, can we surveil these people annually with MRIs instead of annual biopsies, which has been the standard? So things are changing dramatically, and I think that's a very perceptive question that you asked. So I'm glad you did. Any other questions about attempts to cure patients with prostate cancer? Again. 60 to 80 percent of patients who are diagnosed with local di localized disease can be cured. All right. So for patients who have recurrent um, surgery, I'm sorry, recurrent PS, uh, PSA after surgery or radiation, they often present to their doctor with a rising PSA, and there's certain criteria for how we, what we call recurrent disease. It is possible again that for patients who've had surgery to perhaps have salvage radiation, which may be curative, although. The, the is variable how effective these therapies could be. But our approach in these patients primarily is to deprive the tumor of testosterone. And that's again done with either orchiectomy or it can be done with an injection or pharmacological mm -hmm. shot that basically tricks the body into not producing more testosterone. So it decreases production of androgens from the testicles. A study that was published recently looked at continuous androgen deprivation in these patients versus intermittent. So in other words, in this study, they gave eight months of, of testosterone suppression and then slowly let the testosterone recover versus just your testosterone suppressed for the rest of your life. And what they found was after a decade, the survival was roughly equivalent. Side effects of androgen deprivation include sexual dysfunction, fatigue, weight gain, psychological issues, hot flashes. So there's a large constellation of side effects. So that's why with intermittent, they don't have to continuously experience those side effects. So this was an important study. This slide also hints at the timeline of the disease. Remember that 10 years that I mentioned earlier? Unfortunately, other people will be giving you talks during this lecture series about other cancers. I think you're doing small cell next, that group. So uh, those timelines are much, much different. So that also factors in when we choose our therapies in prostate cancer, because oftentimes we're talking about a decade of life after diagnosis, which unfortunately is not a luxury that most uh, patients have with cancer. And this study highlights it's an old, older data. Don't worry about the bullet so much, but you can, in a study that was done with, retrospectively, they saw that on average patients who had surgery had biochemical recurrent disease, so rising PSA about was detected two years later. 
then it's about five to eight years before, on average, they develop metastatic disease, and then it could be three to five years until these patients passed away from their cancer. So these are very long timelines and opportunities for us to intervene at different points to try to make these timelines even longer. Metastatic prostate cancer, again, in terms of newly diagnosed patients, uh, generally it's anywhere between 4 and 10% of patients will show up to their doctor's office with metastatic prostate cancer. In this country, that's largely because of screening. Uh, as certain recommendations, I'm not talking too much about screening today. It's a separate issue, although I'm happy to answer questions if there's time at the end. But as screening goes down, you expect this number to go up. And in Europe and other countries where screening's not done, you see much greater presentation of patients with metastatic disease. When patients do get metastatic disease and prostate cancer, 90% of the disease or 90% of the patients have metastatic disease to the bone. And that's just for reasons we don't fully understand. It could be a kind of a, a soil type thing where that's just a nurturing microenvironment for the tumor. These are things people are investigating. 10% um, of patients will have soft tissue disease alone. But that does not mean that if you only have soft tissue disease, you're going to do worse. This is retrospective data from a uh, chemotherapy trial that led to the approval of docetaxel. It was called TAX327. But in this study, you see some very clear things. Patients with bone disease did generally about the same, whether they had bone disease alone or bone disease with other sites. Lymph node-only disease did really well. So for a while here, and I think this still happens, doctors in the community will see a patient who only has lymph node disease with their metastatic prostate cancer, and they think, that's unusual. I don't see this. It must, must be worse. I'm sending this patient to the NCI. But in reality, these patients do quite well. So just a little lesson, of course, unusual doesn't always mean worse. Now, liver, not surprising with this data, patients who have liver disease do worse in, in metastatic prostate cancer. And this isn't that uncommon amongst other cancer types as well. So I mentioned androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT. There's different ways to implement it. Uh, I won't go into the different treatments, but you can remove the, uh, the testicles through orchiectomy. The testicles are your primary source of androgen production within your body. You can also have production from the adrenal glands, and things like that. Um, we'll get into that a, a, with, one, with one of these therapies a little bit later. But there's also ways to manipulate the endocrine system by manipulating uh, the endocrine axis with either LR, LHRH an, an, agonists or antagonists. And uh, basically, that tricks the body either through direct antagonism or feedback inhibition, which you all probably remember from your endocrine days, into basically not sending a signal to the testicles to produce um, Test, more testosterone. So I, I don't think that I uh, can skip to an important slide again. So this is, this is very relevant, especially for men on hormone therapy. What I'm going to do is there's a lot of therapies in prostate cancer, and part of what we have to do as clinicians is figure out from a side effect standpoint which are best for the patient. So you actually have to kind of know the side effects a little bit. So I don't expect you to memorize this in any context, but you just get a feel for what the side effects are. I mentioned this already sexual issues, physical changes, including weight gain. I didn't mention this. There's increased risk of diabetes and heart attack. It's not dramatic, but it's sufficient for you to be aware of as a clinician. And uh, there can be emotional and cognitive issues as well. So just something we have to talk with our patients about. Um, so again, I mentioned the concept of castration-resistant disease or metastatic castration-resistant disease. So these are patients who were diagnosed. They weren't cured. Disease spread to their bones or their lymph nodes or both. And despite suppression of the testosterone, it continues to grow as measured by PSA or radiographic images. And so that's what we call metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer or metastatic CRPC. And this is the field where all the therapies are approved because if you're a pharma company, you can't wait 15 years to get your drug approved because you missed your patent. So you want to get a timeline where the timelines are maybe three or four years where you can do a study and get an approval. And that's why all the things that I'm going to talk about now were approved in metastatic disease. Um, when I gave this talk a few years ago, these were the only drugs that we could use. Older androgen receptor antagonists, ketoconazole was actually, you can tell by the ending there, azole is an antifungal agent. It was kind of being used in the 80s, and they realized people's PSAs were going down, and they were having responses to their chemotherapy. So really, before 2010, beyond docetaxel, this was our armamentarium. We've moved on from these. We've got much more modern versions of these things. Um, someone made like a billion dollars probably making an updated version of K2 
ketoconazole into a targeted prostate cancer therapy called abiraterone. But uh, these are some of the first generation antiandrogens. Really now, probably more historical footnotes. This is kind of our armamentarium now as we move forward. Um, some of the older therapies are used earlier in the disease because there's not a clear indication for these therapies, but it's probably only a matter of time. So these are the therapies that I showed earlier on that slide, which were all approved, uh, Dosetaxel in 2004 and the rest since 2010. So now I'm gonna just go through the studies that led to their FDA approval so you can have a sense of uh, how, how those studies were done and what these drugs are. So docetaxel, this is why we don't chop down the rainforest or try not to. It's a taxane, uh, and taxanes were initially discovered from trees in the, uh, I think the Pacific Northwest, yeah, the Pacific yew tree. So um, interestingly, uh, again, this also highlights the fact that in my world, we think we know how the therapies we're using actually work when we maybe don't really know as much as we thought. So docetaxels primarily, like I said, a taxane, so it's thought that they inhibit microtubule activity. As you recover, remember from your biology uh, classes, microtubules are required for creating the spindle during mitosis, and so there's too much mitosis and cancer growth, and so that's why docetaxel works. But that's probably not the reason, actually. It all comes down to the androgen receptor in prostate cancer. We can't forget that. Newer data is suggesting that probably the way this drug works in prostate cancer, it prevents the androgen receptor from, once activated in the membrane, uh, to be pulled down into the nucleus with microtubules. So in that sense, it's how microtubule uh, in in inhibition actually has its great greatest effect. And when you think of it in that context, Maybe it's less surprising that the only two chemotherapies that are, have shown clear benefit in prostate cancer for survival are taxanes because they both inhibit microtubules and in essence essentially are targeting androgen receptor, receptor translocation. So again, it highlights that the androgen receptor is very important. So, but we did, this wasn't known in, 19, in 2004 when this data was, was finalized, published in the New England Journal. It's a three-arm study. Uh, Interesting, not a placebo. Mitosantrum prednisone was approved in the 90s for palliation. People didn't necessarily live longer, but it alleviated the symptoms. And they looked at two dosing schedules for side effects, toxicity, and efficacy of the docetaxel. Why was prednisone included? This is, again, just to give you a highlight of how clinical trials are done. I'd like to give you some scientific uh, explanation, but the reality was when they did the study that approved mitosantrone, they basically said, all right, well, let's compare it to something. Let's compare it to prednisone. Prednisone is anti-inflammatory. So in order to do a balanced study in the 90s when they did that study, they did mitosantrone and prednisone versus prednisone alone. So then when they did this study, they said, well, you can't just give mitosantrone with prednisone. Let's give prednisone with docetaxel. And so that's why it's part of this. We do think it probably has an anti-tumor effect. But again, just to see behind the curtain a little bit, not everything is as clearly uh, rational scientifically as you may think. These are the results of the study. They don't look overwhelming, but they clearly show that docetaxel, at least statistically, had a improvement in, in survival in patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, and this led to FDA approval. I've talked at patient groups all over the place, and I can't tell you how many men, when I put up this slide, say, that's why I'm never getting chemotherapy. I'm not going to get chemotherapy to improve my life by one and a half months, okay? So here's the tricky part about studies and why you have to know the studies and how they were done. I didn't mention this on the last slide, but this study had a crossover. What that means is if you got mitosantrone and you had progression, you are allowed to get docetaxel on one of these schedules as a crossover. In previous studies with mitosantrone and prednisone, patients only lived about 10 months. So what you're actually seeing here is what you see with any study that has a crossover, and that is you're underestimating the overall survival benefit. So usually, when I explain that, most people kind of come around and think that, okay, maybe chemotherapy is okay. And if they don't, usually their wife will yell at them, and then they understand a little bit better. But, um, but it is an important thing. Again, it's a general concept as you move forward to looking at different trials of things. Always understand nuances like crossover, which kind of can influence the data. But nonetheless, this was sufficient for FDA approval. And... It improved not just survival, but there was quality of life benefits, improvements in pain, and I already went over the clinical significance of the two and a half months. Here's the side effects, not even for you to read, but there are a lot of side effects with chemotherapy. The big things are 
some neuropathy that can happen, some degree of fatigue, some diarrhea and constipation. Any chemotherapy usually has suppression of uh, uh, neutro neutrophils or neutropenia, which can lead to neutropenic fevers and death, and that's a big deal. So you generally have to figure out if you need to give growth factor support to these patients or if uh, you, know, you want to lower the dose. But a lot of side effects. Most of them are manageable, but uh, we have patients who are getting dose taxol for uh, like three, four, or five years intermittently. So lots of, you can get through these side effects, but it's just good to understand that you can't deny that there are toxicities. Let's shift gears. What happens was this, uh, dose taxol was approved in 2004. What happened for the next six years? Nothing. There was no other advancements. Everyone took their favorite TKI and combined it with dose taxol, and all those trials were negative. It wasn't until a, a therapeutic cancer vaccine came around that basically we had our next therapy that improved um, survival in prostate cancer with metastatic disease. So this is immunotherapy. It's not a checkpoint inhibitor. It, it was approved before all the current checkpoint inhibitors. But basically what you're doing is stimulating the immune system to fight prostate cancer. You, through leukapheresis, you'll isolate the patient's individual immune cells, ship it to either Seattle or Atlanta for basically immunotherapy boot camp, where it's a, a exposed, uh, the immune cells are exposed to a cytokine, GMCSF, and then a target antigen. In this case, it's prostatic acid phosphatase, which is on the surface of cancer cells, sent back into uh, an infusion center infused in the patient. Each infusion uh, is done every two weeks for the month, so three infusions. This was the data, this was a study. They randomized patients to either placebo or the vaccine. And this was the end result of the study, a 4.1 month improvement in survival. Um, these patients probably had earlier disease, which is why it's a little bit longer, but our therapies might have been better too. They might have gotten chemotherapy on the back end. This data to this day is very controversial. I won't go into this in too much detail unless there's time or questions at the end, but there's an overlap here, which highlights the fact that there was no short-term progression. People thought this data was fraudulent. They said, there's no progression, the drug doesn't work, it must be fraudulent, how can you live longer? It's because immunotherapy works differently than standard cytotoxics. We're now seeing this actually with checkpoint inhibitors as well. There's another phase three study that was done before this that showed the same thing, but to this day, people are unshakable in their belief that they don't believe that this therapy works. I think that it was what happens when you're a first-in-class agent and uh, everyone's used to using uh, a chemotherapy or something. So still there's controversy. I think this works, but I do immunotherapy research here, so my opinion is probably biased. But the data is the data. Two phase three studies say it's positive. And again, checkpoint inhibitors are now showing the same thing. Often no short-term changes in progression, but this long-term tail on the curve, as they say, are survival. So just very well tolerated. There's some infusion reactions, fevers, chills, probably immune reaction type things. There was a hint of strokes, but that never really has panned out in post-marketing. Um, so really, probably even shouldn't be on this slide, but very well tolerated. Probably best in patients with indolent disease. Abiraterone. So this is the second generation version of that antifungal agent, ketoconazole, which was thought to have perhaps impact on CYP17, lyase, and hydroxylase. So this, don't worry about the details here. But this is how your body goes from cholesterols to androgens and estrogens. But if you block that, you can block secondary production of testosterone and other androgens in a patient who's already castrate from decreased testicle production. But where is this other testosterone coming from, or these other androgens? There's always been thought that the adrenal glands can supply secondary, and maybe the testosterone suppression from, from the testicles isn't perfect. but What's actually popped up in recent years is a resistance mechanism that's especially sinister if you try to anthropomorphize cancer even a little bit. Cancer cells, prostate cancer cells, can produce their own androgen. So think about that. Through an autocrine loop, they can cre create their own fuel source, and basically that is an escape mechanism how you, you get growth of prostate cancer despite castration levels of testosterone. So. In that setting, the secondary blocking of, of androgen production is invaluable. And indeed, this was a more specialized version than an older version of the drug. The study was done in chemotherapy pa or patients who had already received chemotherapy. 
and randomized patients to placebo or abiraterone. And what they saw was, again, so these patients generally maybe only had a year to live. When they got abiraterone, they lived for about 15 months. And based on this data in 2011, this was a breakthrough. Um, abiraterone was FDA approved. Interestingly, like I said, for about 20 years, and I didn't go back to all the historical stuff, but in 1944, Huggins was a, a Nobel Prize winning researcher who said, you know what? Androgens are important in prostate cancer. It fuels the growth. We developed a bunch of therapies in the 80s. And then in the 90s and 2000s, we did a bunch of combination chemotherapy studies. Kind of forgot that the androgen receptor was so important. But this study came back and said, our older drugs just weren't that effective. Even in castration resistant disease, you can get these survival benefits. So now we kind of reopened the door and, and this uh, drug was approved. There was a study uh, in chemo naive patients that also was done, and you see that there was a, a, a large survival advantage in those patients as well. And so now abiraterone is approved for all patients with metastatic disease. I'll, I'll skip a little bit of the subgroup analysis because it basically showed it worked in everybody. What about side effects? Because of the endocrine manipulation, you get a little bit of edema from some cortisol elevations that come when you suppress this aspect of the, uh, uh, the uh, steroid production. That leads to some edema, some hypertension, otherwise, though, and some fatigue. Um, you can get some liver abnormalities, generally a pretty well-tolerated medication. This treatment actually is also administered with prednisone to minimize some of these cortisol uh, surplus side effects. Unlike docetaxel, there's probably a stronger rationale to use it. And so that can convey its own side effects as well. Enzalutamide is another modern version of an older hormonal therapy. This blocks the androgen receptor. So whatever secondary sources of androgen are producing testosterone, this prevents them from getting to the androgen receptor. Compared to an older version of this drug, bicalutamide, I showed that as one of those historical footnote drugs. It's better at binding to the AR, which means less testosterone can sneak through. It's better at preventing the AR from once binding, getting to the uh, nucleus, and, therefore, and thereby interacting with the DNA. So in really all ways, it's very much better than our older version. And not surprisingly, it's more effective at extending life, as was demonstrated in this study. Uh, again, in patients who already had chemotherapy first, you see that there was an extensive improvement in survival from uh, 18 months to 14 months or 13 and a half months. And um, this was approved by the FDA in 2012. This is highlighting a little bit of a problem that I think we're going to start seeing more of. Enzalutamide is very effective. No one doubts that. This, was a, this trial was done really after abiraterone was approved, after Provenge was approved, after Dostaxel was approved. And in pre-chemotherapy patients, there's a statistically significant difference in survival between these two lines. But you can see it's only about two months. This is a problem in breast cancer, which is now we've been using in all these other studies survival as an endpoint to demonstrate that your drug works, your new drug. It might be something that given all the therapies that are available, the survival signal will get lost if you treat these patients accordingly. In breast cancer, they've been working on this for about two decades, and we've been doing, doing, working on this for about two or three years. But we have to figure out if there are better ways to evaluate the efficacy of these drugs besides survival. And there have been some thought to be effective therapy since that look like they may work, but then they didn't, and that's been part of the controversy. So it's good to have new therapies. It creates problems. It just makes us think a little bit more, and that's probably not a bad thing. Enzalutamide, very well-tolerated drug. Um, actually, I just did a study in basically biochemical recurrent disease because it's such a well-tolerated drug, and you can move it up to patients who don't have metastatic disease and have a decade to live. So, so I think it highlights how well-tolerated it is. That being said, the fatigue is real in some patients. Some patients just said, uh, even patients, I, I have a, one guy who's like in his 40s with metastatic disease, and he's almost to the point of refusing the drug because he can't stay awake on the drug. So we've tried to come down on the dose and things. but So very well tolerated, but great variability in the side effects. Cabazitaxel, it is a second line taxane, which is approved in, in, in prostate cancer. These circle groups, I'm not a chemist either, but these circled, circled hydroxyl groups uh, basically are what differentiate it from docetaxel. But oddly enough, uh, no one expected this drug to really be that, that effective. It wasn't on anyone's radar screen. But this was a study done in patients who had already progressed on docetaxel. And surprisingly, even though progression was about three months uh, on average, 
patients who got the chemotherapy lived about three months longer than patients who didn't. This led to FDA approval as well. Um, this was actually preceded, um, I think, abiraterone in approval. So it was a little bit before all those drugs were available, so there was enthusiasm. I can tell you, though, it's just as another cautionary tale, when this data was presented with the toxicities, there was about 5 or 6% of patients had neutropenic-related infections that led to death. Part of this is because uh, more of the, the vast majority of these patients were accrued outside of the United States, not that America's smarter. It's just here we have greater access to growth factor support and things like that. So I don't think this drug has ever recovered from the fact that they reported that there were 6% or 5 or 6% incidents of neutropenic-related death. There's been a lot of apprehension about using this drug. Some people, you can just give growth factor up front, what a lot of people do. Other people start off with a reduced dose, and then the drug doesn't work. It just highlights the fact that sometimes if you have a drug and it's effective, if you do the study the wrong way, it might never actually get used the way you intended to. So just a kind of a global lesson there. My last uh, therapy that's recently approved in prostate cancer is radium-223. This is a bone-targeting radiopharmaceutical that shoots off alpha particles. I've already told you I'm not a radiation oncologist, so that highlights the fact that I know very little about physics. But from what I'm told, alpha particles are very heavy. So they sh when they get shot off of this little uh, radioactive particle, they don't go so far. So when it binds to an area in the bone that has prostate cancer, you don't have like electrons or protons being shot off, which go through the cancer cell, but then hit a bunch of platelets and red blood cells and kill them. So alpha particles have a shorter destruction radius, therefore they're more likely to impact the tumor, less likely to impact uh, normal blood cells within the bone marrow. And indeed, it is a much, to much better tolerated uh, version of radiopharmaceuticals compared to older radiopharmaceuticals. This was the study that was done. You see a, a trend here, um, radium versus placebo. There was a survival advantage. This was a very heterogeneous population, but it was still a very clear-cut survival advantage. Um, interestingly, other radiopharmaceuticals like samarium and uh, samarium-153 and strontium, which had lighter particles and more side effects, those things demonstrated palliative benefit like radium, but not the survival benefit that's seen in this study. So the reality is people like me, oncologists, aren't really sure where to put this. They kind of wait for patients to have symptomatic disease and then treat it like we use the old drugs, which is symptomatic relief. We're trying to maybe do some studies to highlight how this drug could be used better. But I think that for, patient, for a lot of patients, though, it is well tolerated. So again, I think it's remarkable when you look back and you see that in a very short period of time in prostate cancer, really five years, you've got a hormone, two hormone therapies, a chemotherapy, an immune therapy, really the first modern immune therapy, I would say, and then a radiopharmaceutical, five different therapies approved, different types of therapies, six total, in a very short period of time. And I think it's a culmination of a lot of research that was done in the years that before that. What we still don't know, what we still need to investigate, best sequence, best combinations. We still have to do the studies to do that. Oh, I'm sorry, here are the side effects with radium. It's pretty well tolerated. Um, so here's the landscape again. I'd like to leave time for questions, but I think you guys remember uh, what I've highlighted here. Real quick, old drugs that work in, in different populations. I mentioned docetaxel is approved in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. What about the group of patients that walk into their doctor's office, have a normal testosterone, and um, have metastatic disease? So this would be castration-sensitive prostate cancer. Normally, we just give them androgen deprivation, and until the results of this study, that's what we've done. But what they did was they took, they asked the question in 2007, what if we added chemotherapy for six cycles, just six cycles of chemotherapy in these newly diagnosed metastatic patients who haven't received any real therapy for systemic disease? Lo and behold, they saw one of the biggest readouts we have ever seen in metastatic solid tumors. So this is a profound finding a 13 and a half month improvement in survival, again, because you're starting earlier, where if you add chemotherapy to the initiation of hormone therapy in patients with metastatic disease, you got this profound benefit. Now realize this doesn't apply to every patient, but for this subgroup, this is a real game changer. And so we're looking at ways and other people are to improve on this. So uh, I won't go into a lot of details on that, just in the interest of time, it's very well tolerated. But the one thing that I've highlighted a little bit in my talk, but I couldn't get into is, we still don't know the best way to sequence these therapies. There are some studies going on right now. Breast cancer has really looked at this as well for a long time. It's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, 
And then mechanisms of resistance. I talked about secondary productions of androgens from prostate cancer cells themselves. What's become clear in just the last two years, uh, two and a half years or so, is that the androgen receptor, remember I said the androgen receptor is key in prostate cancer? Well, there are clones that can develop over time that have every part of the androgen receptor except the receptor. That sounds crazy, but you basically get these variant clones that have the entire framework of the androgen receptor uh, cascade in terms of triggering cell proliferation, except it doesn't have an extracellular ligand binding domain for the testosterone. So what that means is all your therapies that lower testosterone, all your therapies that block testosterone don't work in those clones. So that's what's being seen now is a lot of different, uh, what we call of these androgen receptor variants that are constitutionally activated despite the eradication of testosterone uh, from the tumor microenvironment. And now we have to figure out ways to, to interfere with that because now just barrier uh, methods or, or uh, testosterone suppression and those clones won't work. Also speaks to the heterogeneity of the disease. Okay, so I, I think I'm gonna stop there with about five minutes left for questions or at least a break before your next lecture. I thank you for your kind attention. I, everybody stayed awake, I'm super impressed. I, I almost fell asleep, but you guys kept me awake, so I thank you very much for your time and attention. Yes? A great, great question. So I do a lot of immunotherapy here, so we try to design trials, and, and we have some data from our group as well as other groups that suggest that slower pace of disease, so not like showing up in your office with like cancer in three places, then in a month later, like 10 places, so slower pace of disease and smaller volume of disease. Those are things that I think globally the immune system can get a better handle on and, um, I, 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 and less symptoms because that also speaks a little bit to the volume of disease. So, so slower pace, slower volume of disease. And I think that's globally true for multiple cancers. And so if I see a patient who has one bone lesion, I'll be very encouraging them to get that sipilucil T first and then come back for any of the other therapies for that reason. Also, the effects of the immune therapy can be amplified over time. If you start the, we have data that shows if you start uh, immunotherapy, it slows the growth over time. So if, you, if your timeline is like two years, you can maybe increase that by 50%, that's three years. But if your timeline's six months, if you can get a benefit, even 50% is three months. So it just gives you more, don't pay attention to the actual numbers there, but I think that highlights, again, retrospective data supports that. Good question. All right, any other questions? All right, great, thank you all very much. Appreciate uh, your time. Okay, so now we're going to talk about small cell lung cancer. And the big difference is this is a uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So prostate cancer, like uh, most cancers, are epithelial cancers. This is a neuroendocrine cancer. So it kills about 25,000 patients in the U.S. annually, and it's responsive to both chemo and radiation therapy. But... Uh, Frequently, relapse rapidly occurs, and the median survival time is less than one year. So for the small cell lung cancer, the cells are small. There's a big nuclei, very scant cytoplasm. It has a very distinctive morphology that the pathologist can readily uh, ascertain. And then what's unique about it is there's these dense core neurosecretory granules that are present. And so these granules can undergo exocytosis and release growth factors. So basically, the more cancer you have, the more uh, exocytosis can occur, and the growth factors are like food. The more cancer, the more food, the more rapidly it grows. 
So what are the symptoms of small cell lung cancer? Well, uh, traditionally people have coughs or they have chest pain. Um, but one of my friends was recently diagnosed with lung cancer and she had shortness of breath, trouble going upstairs. And she was very surprised then when she went to see the physician and they diagnosed lung cancer. So uh, as the lung cancer progresses, there can be uh, pneumonia, bacterial infections or bronchitis. And the worst sign is if you uh, have bloody sputum, that means you have a lot of cancer. So traditionally it's diagnosed with a chest X-ray, but uh, uh, you can also put a tube down your throat, a bronchoscopy. If you find a lesion, you can do a needle aspirate and ascertain the presence of tumor. Thoriocentesis refers to fluid between the uh, lungs and the chest wall. And uh, the more recent thing that's developed is the spiral CT. And uh, this is very sensitive, but the problem then is there's false positives that result. So with spiral CT, the hope is that you can diagnose the lung cancer earlier when it's in a more amenable stage to surgical resection. And if you could identify the cancer in stage one, then you can do the resection. So this is the chest X-ray, and you see a mass of tumor here in the lungs. This is the uh, CT scan, and you see here a tumor that develops with time. And this is the bronchoscopy. And on the left here, you see something budding from the uh, thorax. And you would then do a dissection of this and ascertain if it were a tumor or not. So in terms of staging of the lung cancer, well, it's often diagnosed in stage four where metastasis has occurred. But uh, if you can identify it early, then it's more amenable to treatment. And so uh, the tumors, they can be detected when they're uh, a few centimeters in size and then when they're greater than seven centimeters, oftentimes they can undergo uh, metastasis at that point. So uh, we mentioned about the CT scan. You can also use MRI. With PET scanning, oftentimes what you do is use F18 uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. Uh, with radionuclide scanning, you're looking for hot spots, and oftentimes the small cell lung cancer will undergo metastasis to the bone. And then you can look in the uh, chest cavity between the lungs for tumors. So if you undergo surgery, the median survival time is 6.5 months. If you undergo radiotherapy, the median survival time is 10 months. In all cases, uh, the patients usually live less than a year. So in terms of chemotherapy, uh, many drugs have been used. There's alkylating agents such as carboplatin, cyclophosphamide, there's uh, agents that affect tubulin, such as vincristine, phenarelbine. Um, there are topoisomerase inhibitors, such as arenotecan, topotecan, and BP16. So there's a wide variety of drugs that can be used. And frequently what's done is they use combination chemotherapy. So in this case, you have cyclophosphamide, 
which is an alkylating agent combining with doxorubicin, which affects the intercalates into the DNA. And BP16 is a topoisomerase inhibitor, and they just abbreviate this, CDE. And so you see numerous combination chemotherapies have been tried. In terms of radiation therapy, uh, uh, this can be effective. And if it's combined with chemotherapy, such as the topoisomerase inhibitor, BP16, and cisplatin, which is an alkylating agent, you can increase the five-year survival from 6% to 30 percent. But the problem is small cell lung cancer, it often undergoes relapse. And so we mentioned before about how cancer is a moving target. And with lung cancer, often it results because uh, you're smoking cigarettes. So this takes 20 to 30 years to develop. And you get a first clone of cells growing out. And this may be uh, sensitive to chemotherapy. But then a short time later, a second clone may grow out, and this is resistant to the chemotherapy, and then this is what will kill you. So this is referred to as the field effect, that oftentimes after relapse, chemotherapy is ineffective. And then uh, this cancer undergoes extensive metastasis, we see that the metastasis can occur to the liver, to the bone, the adrenals, the lymph nodes, and the worst of all is when it gets into the brain. Uh, and uh, I had one friend who had small cell lung cancer and it got into the brain and she died within two weeks. The brain has many growth factors that rapidly facilitates the growth of the tumor. So with many of the uh, epithelial cancers, they have a feel for how the cancer progresses. But there is no such uh, knowledge known about small cell lung cancer. Uh, it's probably initiated by tobacco smoke carcinogens. But what cells become the small cell lung cancer, no one knows. Is it derived from a neuroendocrine Kolchitsky cell? Or is it some sort of stem cell? And this is still an area that's a great mystery. And the cigarette smoke has nicotine in it. And nicotine can bind to acetylcholine receptors on the lung cancer cells. These are G protein coupled receptors, ultimately leading to AKT phosphorylation and increased survival. Uh, the carcinogen NNK, it can form uh, DNA addicts, and if the cells do not undergo apoptosis, mutations can accumulate. So NNK, one of the unique things about it is it's metabolized to NNAL, which is a unique metabolite that can be measured in the urine of patients by gas chromatography. Its presence indicates exposure to cigarette smoke. So this can increase then in both smokers and non-smokers who breathe in the cigarette smoke secondhand. So one of the unique things that NCI was able to do back in the 1980s was develop cell lines from lung cancer. And I collaborated with the group up here and basically they would get uh, bone marrow aspirates from patients. And then the tumors were mechanically dissociated and cell suspensions obtained. And the cells were cultured in a serum-free medium containing selenium, IGF-1, and transferrin. The normal cells all died, but the cancer cells grew out. And in about one out of six patients, they were able to get a cell line. So this slide just illustrates that uh, in small cell lung cancer, transferrin provides iron to the cells, and many of the DNA uh, 
enzymes require iron. IGF-1 binds to tyrosine kinase receptors, uh, leading to increased proliferation. And one of the factors that uh, I work with in the early 1980s was called gastrin-releasing peptide, and it binds to G-protein-coupled receptors, stimulating proliferation. We mentioned before that the small cell lung cancer has granules. When the granules undergo exocytosis, the growth factors are released. Then they come back and bind to cell surface receptors, stimulating their proliferation further. So uh, NCI then established all these cell lines. In many cancers, you don't have a lot of cell lines to work with. But uh, over a period of 20 years, NCI developed hundreds of these cell lines. And they were the small cell lung cancers. They were characterized by high levels of GRP or bombesin, uh, neural enzymes such as neuron-specific enolase, and high levels of enzymes involved in uh, catecholamine metabolism such as dopa decarboxylase. So uh, over a 20-year period then, there were over 100 small cell lung cancer cell lines developed and 100 uh, non-small cell lung cancer cell lines. Strangely, the small cell lung cancers grew as floating aggregates. They didn't adhere to the uh, dishes, whereas the non-small cell lung cancer cells, they were all epithelial and they were all adherent. So the neuroendocrine small cell lung cancer cells are different. <coughs> and Dr. Jackaloo mentioned about in terms of animal models, one of the animal models is the AJ mouse, which gets these adenomas on the lung. And the uh, phospholipids in the cancer cells can be metabolized to arachidonic acid, leading to the presence of leukotrienes as well as prostaglandins. So in colon cancer, it was found that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, uh, decreased proliferation. And they're actually chemopreventive. Um, and in lung cancer, the aspirin also worked, inhibiting the growth. And if you added increasing amounts of prostaglandin E2, the growth returned to normal. So the prostaglandin E2 then is a growth factor. Um, another thing that inhibited the cyclooxygenase enzymes is endomethacin. And endomethacin reduced the formation of tumors in the lung of the mice. So in the lung then, there's three major types of cells, the alveoli, and you see some scattered immunoreactivity here for cyclooxygenase 2. This is a key enzyme that gets turned on by growth factors in the cancer cells. In the uh, bronchus, in the muscle layer of the bronchus, there's lots of COX-2 immunoreactivity but not on the bone part. And then in the bronchioles, there was scattered immunoreactivity of the cyclooxygenase 2, which is brown in color. So the cyclooxygenase 2 then, it showed intense staining in all three lung compartments, the bronchus, the bronchioles, and the alveoli, as well as the adeno, adenoma, the tumor. And here, by RT-PCR, there's two types of cyclooxygenases in the cancer cells. Cyclooxygenase 1, which is constitutive. And then the cyclooxygenase 2 is inducible. And here, we're adding increasing amounts of EGF to the cells. And the cyclooxygenase 2 mRNA is going up. So the cyclooxygenase 2 then, it gets turned on by growth factors, releasing lots of uh, prostaglandin E2. 
And the prostaglandin E2 can then have several effects on the cells, leading to growth stimulation. For one, it can tyrosine phosphorylate the EGF receptor. And we mentioned before that the EGF receptor is a big player in lung cancer, especially when it's mutated. And we found if we added a antagonist of the prostaglandin E2 receptor, then that this stimulation of the EGF receptor was blocked. And downstream, we found that prostaglandin E2, it would also phosphorylate ERK, when phosphorylated ERK can then enter the nucleus and cause growth factor production. So the prostaglandin E2 then, it's derived from the arachidonic acid and its production is especially increased by the cyclooxygenase 2 in the cancer cells. And then when the uh, nucleus is stimulated, various growth factors get produced, one of which is vascular endothelial cell growth factor, an angiogenic factor. And we see here PGE2 doubles the VEGF mRNA in the cancer cells, PGF does a similar phenomena, and this can be blocked using H89, which inhibits adenylyl cyclase activity. So the prostaglandin E2 then, uh, when it binds to the EP2 receptor, it can increase the cyclic A, and when the cyclic A goes up, then the protein kinase A gets stimulated, leading to phosphorylation of Krebs, increasing expression of the angiogenic factor, the vascular endothelial cell growth factor. So the prostaglandin E2, it gets increased in the cancer cells by the, by the COX-2, and it binds to this receptor, the EP2 receptor. And then the EP2 receptor, it can activate other factors in the cancer cells, such as SARC, and matrix metalloprotease to produce TGF-alpha, which causes the phosphorylation of the EGF receptor. So what we see here is basically an autocrine growth cycle. And this is what happens a lot in the uh, lung cancer cells. One of these cycles goes through the EGF receptor. And when that gets turned on, COX-2 gets turned on, PGE2 gets elevated, and then this leads to increased expression of various growth factors. So these autocrine growth cycles then occur in the cancer cells all the time. And what's unique about them is you have a G protein coupled receptor, then turning on the EGF receptor, and this is a very strong tyrosine kinase receptor that can create havoc. And when uh, VEGF goes up, then that's going to increase angiogenesis of the tumor and lead to a very deadly situation. So the COX inhibitors, they're very uh, intriguing as preventive agents, but the thing you have to watch out for is they can cause stomach ulcers. And so subsequently, they developed a selective COX-2 inhibitor, celecoxib, and it has minimal side effects. And so they're doing clinical trials now using the celecoxib in lung cancer patients to see if this can uh, be an effective uh, therapy. Okay, so we'll look now at some of the uh, peculiarities of the small cell lung cancer, and we'll be focusing on the RB, retinoblastoma gene. The retinoblastoma gene is a tumor suppressor, as is P53 and FIT, so each of these get inactivated in small cell lung cancer. And BCL2 gets overexpressed. And this is bad because uh, BCL2 increases survival of the cancer cells. 
So for P53, we mentioned before, it mediates the G1 to S phase checkpoint of the cell cycle. And when P53 is present, it causes programmed cell death or apoptosis after DNA damage. But when P53 gets mutated, uh, then it's inactive and the cell will rapidly go from the G1 to S phase. In S phase, the DNA gets replicated. So retinoblastoma, uh, it's more associated with the G phase, and in particular, normal cells can rest in the G0 phase. But when uh, RB uh, gets mutated, or uh, there's other factors that occur leading to its inactivation, then the cells can't rest in G0 phase. And cancer cells, they basically try to grow as rapidly as possible. So in uh, tissue culture, essentially these cells double every day. And the FIT gene is the fragile histidine triad. And it was very interesting because it's located in chromosome 3P. And chromosome 3P is one of the chromosomes that gets deleted early in the uh, carcinogenic process for small cell lung cancer. And so they thought initially that FIT might be the tumor suppressor gene that's very important on chromosome P3. So this is still an area that they are uh, investigating. And finally, we get to BCL2, which is overexpressed. And BCL2 suppresses apoptosis and inhibits responses to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So they're currently investigating uh, ways to minimize the effects of BCL2. And one of these uses an antisense to BCL2. So with uh, small cell lung cancer, there's a lot of genetic abnormalities. And you see we have allelic loss in many chromosomes especially 3P and 17P, where uh, the P53 gene is. And uh, we'll be going through microsatellite instabilities, MIC overexpression, uh, CKIT overexpression, and then we'll be talking about the bombesan gastrin-releasing peptide overexpression. So the 3P deletion is an early event. And subsequently, there's uh, deletions in 5Q, 13Q, and 17P. So in lung cancer, another thing that they see is there's many macrocytolite alterations, such as uh, two to five base pairs uh, get repeated uh, dozens of times. And as a result, then, there's laddering that results from mutations in DNA mismatch repair enzymes. And the microsatellite instability may be useful for early diagnosis of lung cancer using sputum, bronchial washings, or blood. So MYC is a nuclear oncogene that's associated with growth. And MIC heterodimerizes with MAX, uh, facilitating cell cycle progression. And LKB, it's a tumor suppressor. It's uh, an enzyme. It's a serine threonine kinase that's inactivated in about half of the small cell lung cancer patients. It causes phosphorylation of this AMP activated protein kinase, AMPK, resulting in tumor growth suppression. So uh, the IGF-1, it's an important tyrosine kinase receptor in the small cell lung cancer. 
So the IGF-1, it binds to the tyrosine kinase, and this one's rather unusual because it's got two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. The alpha subunits bind to the uh, IGF-1, and the beta subunits have the tyrosine kinase activity. And so here's a Western blot where we're seeing binding to the alpha subunit. And we actually used a monoclonal antibody against the IGF-1 receptor to inhibit growth. So here you see using this monoclonal antibody in nude mice, the tumor growth is dramatically slowed in the presence of the antibody. So IGF-1 then enhances the survival of small cell lung cancer cells. In particular, it goes through the phosphatidyl and isotol 3 kinase, and then in turn, AKT gets phosphorylated, resulting in increased cancer cell survival. <coughs> and another uh, entity that comes in, here we see the uh, tyrosine kinase receptor forming a dimer, then causing the phosphorylation of the PI3 kinase, activating it, leading to the phosphorylation of the AKT. And phosphorylated AKT ultimately causes increased expression of BCL2, which will increase cancer cell survival. So another factor in the small cell lung cancer is the uh, SCF. And this ligand then binds to the CKIT receptor, which is also a tyrosine kinase receptor. So the CKIT receptor, um, it binds the SCF, and then we get increased tyrosine kinase activity leading to increased uh, PI3 kinase activity and phosphorylation of AKT. And finally, what I found is early in the 1980s, we found that the small cell lung cancer cell lines had high levels of bombesin-like peptides, especially the GRP, gastrin-releasing peptide. And so initial studies uh, utilized a monoclonal antibody against the growth factor. And we see the nude mice, they had large tumors, but if they were treated with this antibody, the tumors were very small in size. And this was actually then developed and tried in patients, but only one patient out of 13 responded. So. Subsequently, we moved on to other things. And here you see a typical structure of a G-protein coupled receptor. It's got an extracellular end terminal. It crosses the membrane seven times. It's got an intracellular C terminal. And usually this third intracellular loop stimulates then production of second messengers. So the uh, GRP receptor, uh, surprisingly, it's on the X chromosome. And as a result then, the females are going to have more of the GRP receptor than are the males. And uh, currently, studies are investigating if females are more susceptible to lung cancer because of the localization of this G-protein coupled receptor on the X chromosome. And here we're looking at cells as they respond when you add the bombesin or the GRP. And in this case, we've loaded up the cells with dye and we see within a few seconds after addition of the growth factor, the cells start to turn yellow in color. And this is because their cytosolic calcium is elevating and the response is very rapid and within a few minutes the cells their cellular calcium returns to normal levels 
So we can then use the cellular calcium as an indication of expression to the growth factor. And then antagonists were developed for the receptor that blocked the calcium response. So these antagonists are small alkaloids, uh, small molecules, and they inhibit the growth of the lung cancer cells. And here we see that the bombesin-like peptides we mentioned before, they can uh, cause transactivation of the EGF receptor resulting in phosphorylation. And the antagonist blocks the tyrosine phosphorylation of the EGF receptor. Similarly, they increase the phosphorylation of ERK, which then goes into the nucleus and causes uh, altered growth factor expression. And the antagonists block that response as well. So these antagonists then, they inhibit growth. But what's very interesting is we mentioned before that gefitinib, it's used to treat patients with EGF receptor mutations. And in this case, this cell line had a wild type receptor, but we found that the bombesin antagonist potentiated the effect of the gefitinib. So the potency of the gefitinib then was increased about tenfold. So uh, we're currently in the process of doing studies to see uh, if this occurs preclinically in mice as well. So the signal transduction mechanisms then are fairly complex because we have the G-protein coupled receptors such as the bombesin receptor. It elevates calcium, but then it causes uh, activation of other proteins, such as protein kinase C, SARC, matrix metalloprotease, ultimately leading to phosphorylation of the EGF receptor. And then when the EGF receptor gets phosphorylated, uh, ERK can be phosphorylated, altering growth factor expression. But PI3 kinase can also be activated leading to phosphorylation of AKT and increased cellular survival. So these growth factors then, they don't work independently. They work together to stimulate cancer cellular proliferation. So in summary then, for the small cell lung cancer, it's a neuroendocrine tumor that initially responds to chemotherapy, but subsequently relapse occurs in the patients. And multiple clinical trials are in progress to try to improve the treatment of small cell lung cancer, but we've still got a long ways to go. So we want to close by talking about smoking. And uh, most lung cancer occurs in people who smoke cigarettes. And so the reason lung cancer has leveled off in terms of the number of deaths now is because in this country, we have lots of anti-smoking measures going on. The most effective thing that they found initially was just raising the tax on cigarettes, make the cigarettes so expensive that people can't afford to buy as many of them. And so this has proven especially effective with teenagers. Um, but if you do smoke, now we've developed a whole series of drugs as well that you can use to try to uh, decrease your dependency on the cigarettes. So we have nicotine replacement therapy, which includes gum, nicorette, or a patch, Nicoderm, or a nasal spray, Nicotrol. So here you're basically trying to inject nicotine into the patient short term so that they don't have to smoke. The second approach is using pills. People who stop smoking often get very depressed. So this drug, bupropion, it's an antidepressant. Or another thing, you may see commercials on tea about Santix. 
varenicline tartrate, and this reduces the smoking urge and withdrawal symptoms. But uh, the best way to give up smoking is just to go cold turkey, and you can get assistance from healthcare professionals or use various medications. Those people who try to stop smoking, they're not successful the first time, and they have to uh, try again and again. So early failure is a normal part of trying to stop smoking. And also smoking cigarettes, of course, leads to nicotine addiction. And we mentioned that going cold turkey after a gradual reduction of the number of cigarettes you smoke each day is ultimately the most successful way. So when you stop smoking within 20 minutes, your blood pressure and heart rate decrease. Within 12 hours, carbon monoxide levels return to normal in your blood. Within two days, your sense of smell and taste return. Within nine months, there's a decrease in cough and a shortness of breath. And within 10 years, the risk of stroke is normal and the risk of dying from lung cancer is reduced significantly. So as you all know in the government, there's no smoking allowed on the NIH campus and uh, uh, there's lots of health benefits from uh, stopping smoking. So uh, in this country, we have 45 million smokers but now we have 45 million ex-smokers as well, and the risk of dying from lung cancer slowly decreases. But elsewhere in the world, smoking is on the increase, such as China. And so we know in about 20 years in China, they're going to have a big increase in the uh, amount of lung cancer patients. And so we have various programs to interact with other countries where the smoking rate is going up. And here's some references, and that's about it. So are there any questions? Yes. Well, 10 years ago, none of these pills and uh, nicotine delivery systems were present. And uh, as a result, the number of smokers was very, very high. And now you see, because of all these sophisticated methods now, the number of ex-smokers is very high in this country. And the number of new smokers, it's gradually gone down. But especially in men, the number of deaths from lung cancer has gone down dramatically. Uh, but unfortunately, then the women started smoking, and now they've sort of leveled off. So the number, uh, for a while on TV, you'd see these commercials about the new women, and they'd be smoking cigarettes. and. Uh, now we don't allow any smoking commercials on TV anymore. Well, see, there's a problem with the nicotine replacement therapy because nicotine itself sort of increases your risk for lung cancer because the nicotine binds to this one receptor that's on the cells. So uh, when you're using the uh, nicotine delivery systems, you only use them for a short time, a month or two at most. Because if you were to use them all the time, that would increase your risk of lung cancer. So all of these drugs, it's nice that they help people stop smoking, but then you don't want people getting addicted to the drugs because they have nicotine. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so the question is about the vaporizers to deliver the 
uh, nicotine. And personally, I don't think that's a very good idea. You know, uh, uh, then you're sort of breathing it in and it's getting deep into your lungs. Whereas if you're ingesting it, uh, you're not gonna get as much in the lungs. It's going to go into the stomach and be metabolized elsewhere. So I think uh, the vaporizers may be more effective at delivering the nicotine, but that's not necessarily a good idea. <laughs> okay, that'll do it. So next week we'll have class on Monday and we'll have our radiation oncology lecture then. <laughs>